One of the most interesting what-ifs about the Civil War involves what would have happened if the British had recognized the Southern Confederacy. They came tantalizingly close to doing so, and if they had, not only might the war between the states have had a different outcome, but so might the course of 20th and 21st century history. Today I'd like to share an account by Robert Bunch, the British consul to Charleston, South Carolina, before and during the first half of the Civil War, of a conversation he had in 1860 with Robert Barnwell Rhett, a Southern lawyer, planter, politician, and newspaper publisher who had first flirted with secession in 1828. Rhett's disunionist views caused him to spend most of his checkered political career in the wilderness. He resigned his U.S. Senate seat in 1852 when a state convention voted against secession. But when Rhett paid Bunch a visit on December 15, 1860, five days before a convention of delegates assembled in Charleston passed an ordinance of secession, he was enjoying that rare feeling of the times having caught up with him, and he expected to play an important role in any future Confederate government. Bunch wrote about their conversation in a letter to Lord John Russell, the British foreign minister who'd been prime minister before and would be again. Our excerpt starts after Bunch has explained who Rhett is and described their initial feeling out process. Mr. Rhett then came to what was evidently the real object of his visit, viz. an exposition of the probable policy of the state of South Carolina after secession, a policy which he believed would be in the main that of a southern confederacy, the formation of which, at any rate as far as the cotton states were concerned, he regarded as certain within 60 days from this date. He stated that the wishes and hopes of the southern states centered in England, that they would prefer an alliance with her to one with any other power, that they would be her best customers, that free trade would form an integral portion of their scheme of government, with import duties of nominal amount and direct communication by steam between the southern and British ports. Thus, he hoped that with Great Britain dependent upon the South for cotton, upon which supposed axiom, I would remark, all their calculations are based, and the South upon her for manufactured goods and shipping, an interchange of commodities would ensue, which would lead to an unrestricted intercourse of the most friendly character. He did not conceal from himself that the feeling of the British public was adverse to the system of slavery, but he saw no reason why that sentiment should stand in the way of commercial advantages. Great Britain traded largely with Brazil, which was a slaveholding country, and was, moreover, the largest customer of the southern states for the productions of slave labor. In replying to Mr. Red's observations, I stated in the most explicit manner that I had no authority to speak on behalf of Her Majesty's government, so that any remarks which I might make respecting the views he had propounded would be altogether my own. But I had, of course, no objection to talk the matter over with him, as one friend might with another, but nothing more. I then said that, so far as I could judge, there seemed to be no reason why his ideas should not be carried out into practice, that Great Britain was much interested in the success of free trade, in the benefits of which she was a firm believer, and that if the South would carry out that idea, and perhaps open their coasting trade to British ships, I thought that such a movement would be acceptable to the British people. As regarded the question of domestic slavery, I really saw no reason to apprehend an interference with it on their part, as it was a matter with which they had no direct concern, that they could indeed wish that their own example might act favorably upon the South in its estimate of the moral wrong of such a system of labor, but that beyond this they were likely not to go. Thus far I agreed in the main with him. There was a point he had not touched which appeared to me to offer a difficulty of considerable magnitude, 
and respecting which I should be glad to hear his opinion, I alluded to the revival of the African slave trade, which Great Britain viewed with horror, and which, so far as I was informed, was likely to be tolerated, if not encouraged, by the new confederation. I expressed my opinion that Great Britain would require from that body some very distinct assurance of a satisfactory nature on this subject before she could be brought to enter cordially into communication with it. Upon this question, Mr. Rett took a very decided stand. He said that no southern state or confederacy would ever be brought to negotiate upon such a subject that to prohibit the slave trade was virtually to admit that the institution of slavery was an evil and a wrong, instead of, as the South believed it, a blessing to the African race and a system of labor appointed of God. He expressed his opinion that a requirement on the part of Great Britain that the slave trade should be prohibited would render any understanding impossible. In that case, he continued, we should go to France and offer her commercial advantages of the most liberal character, provided she would not interfere with us on that question. Our place, he said, is to commence by levying a duty of 15% on all importations of foreign goods, which duty may be diminished to 5% or withdrawn altogether on the manufactures of such states as will fall into our views and make treaties with us on our own terms. He had no doubt that France and Germany would gladly avoid the question of the revival of the slave trade for this consideration, in which case England would be left behind and lose the advantages which would otherwise accrue to her. I remarked to Mr. Rett that he seemed to me to be a little hasty in reckoning with such certainty upon the readiness of France and other European nations that apart from the universal detestation of the African slave trade felt by all civilized people, he could not forget that nearly all the powers of Europe were bound by treaty to repress it, and that it was hardly likely that they would tolerate in one nation, for the sake of commercial gain, that which they had systematically and continually reprobated in all others. Mr. Rett then said that although he personally and nearly all the politicians of the older states were opposed to the introduction of fresh slaves from Africa, he felt assured that the newer states of the present Union, such as Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana, would insist upon the revival of the traffic, that they required fresh laborers in view of the increasing demand for cotton, and that such labor could only be obtained from Africa. He thought, however, that, such a comp that a compromise might be effected to meet the objections of the European nations, and the new confederacy be allowed to import slaves for a limited period of five years, after which the traffic should cease. This, he remarked, was done by the government of the United States in the early days of its existence. I repeated my belief that some satisfactory arrangement on this point would be essential to the recognition of the new confederacy and our conversation terminated. I trust that your lordship will not disapprove the language I have held. I could not well avoid a discussion of the matter, and from the position of Mr. Rett I deemed it wise not to discourage his approaches. There is just now a very strong feeling in favor of Great Britain, which is unusual and may prove of advantage. I have the honor to be, with the highest respect, my lord, your Lordship's most obedient, humble servant, Robert Bunch. Rhett's inflated sense of his own importance and influence would soon be punctured. As his biographer, William C. Davis, recounts, Rhett only received the seventh most votes cast to choose the South Carolina delegation sent to Montgomery, Alabama to join six other states in forming a new Confederate government. His fellow South Carolinians declined to support him for the presidency, and Jefferson Davis neither invited him to join his cabinet nor named him commissioner to England, an appointment Bunch believed Rhett was hoping for. After finishing his term in the Provisional Congress, Rhett spent most of the war doing whatever he could, mostly through his newspaper, the Charleston Mercury, to undermine Davis. I've got more at my website and free newsletter on what became of Bunch, just how close the British came to recognizing the Confederacy, 
and one historian's take on how things might have been different if they had. Click the link in the description for all that and more. And I hope you'll subscribe to this channel, hit that like button, share this video with anyone who might be interested, and leave a comment with your thoughts on Bunch, Rhett, or relations between the British and the Southerners. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.